So we're in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, moving right on through. And here's what it says. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him, and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly, I say to you, for I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed in that very moment. That's a full story, isn't it? You see why we're going yeah, to full meal deal, Vicky says. We're going we're gonna to be in this story for a few weeks, I think. Um, one, one uh, I'm not sure uh, that we'll talk much about this today, but one of, the, one of the really pointed revelations in this story is that the servant was lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Uh, I have seen people paralyzed and not paralyzed physically. They could get up and the, the worst thing a person fearfully tormented can do is get up and move around. So it's kind of almost a blessing to be, for them to be, stay put, right? So we're not going to talk much about that, but fearfully tormented is a horrible place to be. It's a horrible place to be. And we know in our life, all around us, all around, we do homeless ministry, and we see people all the time fearfully tormented. So it's a, it's a real clear picture to us how many people we see that are paralyzed in life and cannot move. And this, uh, there's... The story of the centurion. Jesus saying, I haven't seen faith like this anywhere. There's a story of the sons of the kingdom being cast out and told you outer darkness, and there'll be weeping of gnashing of teeth. They're not getting in. Sons of the kingdom. Did you miss that part? Sons of the kingdom cast out. I mean, whoa. And yet, me and you, we want to be sons of the kingdom. Because sons of the kingdom will also be reclining at table. But the one thing pointed out here is it's not a guarantee. You've got to respond. What's he talking about? Who are the sons kicked out and who are the sons let in? We want to talk about that over the next few weeks. But today we just want to talk about the centurion. And I don't want to leave you with so much information. So first let me just tell you what a centurion is because I'm pretty sure a lot of you don't know. There were several kinds of centurions in the Roman army. First off, a centurion is a Roman military office. It's a what we would call rank today. And all it means is leader of a hundred. But by the time of Jesus' time, centurions had existed a long time. And the most common reference to today's world is sergeant. They would be the non-commissioned officer. They're actually in the dirt with the men. They fight. They lead groups of a hundred. They have men under them. And they have incredible authority under those hundred men, over those hundred men. But the second kind of centurion is also a leader of a hundred, but he's a garrison centurion. Meaning, when they occupy, there's the occupied centurions and there's the beating the enemy. So, seldom does a man in this position go out and fight battles against armies. They usually occupy what's behind the, what the army did. Do you follow that? This guy here is mentioned a couple times in the Bible as the one, he's the centurion that supposedly. Maybe he's the centurion that donated money to, f to fix the uh, roof of the synagogue. Maybe he's the centurion that said, truly this man was the son of God. He's in the right place to be all of those. And it's, some people believe it's him, or at least it's the position. The fact that he had money to donate means he's one of two types of uh, centurions. One is guy that earned it through battle, 
and kept being promoted until he was allowed to go back and be the centurion in garrisons, meaning he didn't have to fight anymore. He did, he did have to, they were, you know, he did have, in Israel, they were attacked by, by zealots. But at least they weren't out there in the front lines. And so usually, the second kind was a political importance that got you into that position. The centurion had money to donate. Probably you don't get paid a lot, but you do get to steal a lot. So in his position, when you go into a country, you rape and pillage and you kill and you submit and, and severe submission, they end up stealing a lot. But it's also possible that he came from a political positioning. He did the favor for somebody that got him here. So that's who this man might be, probably is, is a centurion with political power. Whether he earned it on the battlefield or not, we can't really know that about him. Whether he really is the guy that said, truly this is the Son of God at the crucifixion. We're not positive, but he's in the right position to be the one mentioned several times. Are you with me? So he comes to Jesus, which is not normal for a centurion. These people are under his feet. They're below him. He sends a, he sends a private or a corporal to, the, to, to talk to Jesus, right? But he goes to Jesus himself. My servant is fearfully tormented. And then he says, I'll come heal him. Jesus says, I'll come heal him. Centurion says something completely out of character for centurions to say. They're brutal men. He says, I'm not worthy that you should come my roof. A Roman man recognizes who Jesus is and his holiness. He recognizes Jesus' authority. He recognizes his power, and he says, I'm not worthy to come have you come to my house. Not only that, in this country, if Jesus comes to his house, Jesus is dirty. Coming to that man's house makes Jesus dirty in the eyes of all of the religious leaders. I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant would be healed. And Jesus begins, he says, for I am a man under authority. I'm sorry, I left off the most important part. I am a man under authority. I have men under me. In other words, I'm under men and men are under me. And I know if you say the word, my servant will be healed. Here's... It's all kind of like, you know, like Hollywood right now. we got a Hollywood setup. And then Jesus says something so crazy that we as Christians have ignored for, I mean, at least my 42 years. I, I never hear anybody talking about this. I have never heard in all of Israel such faith. A Roman centurion brought in to hold them at bay, to hold them under the thumb of Rome. Brutal man in a brutal position. Jesus says about him, I have never heard faith like this in all of Israel. And what did he say that made Jesus say that? That's what is so important. In my opinion, it's I'm a man under authority. I do what people tell me, and people do what I say. And I know if you say to those demons, leave this man alone, they will leave him alone. And Jesus says, I have not heard faith like this anywhere in all of Israel. Go, your servant will be made well. I really want Jesus to do the things I ask him to do. I really want Jesus to do the things I need him to do. I really want to be at the end of my days, when, I, when I'm on my deathbed or when I am at my last moment, I want to look back and know that I believed. That last, phrase, that last statement, here's what Jesus said to him. Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. On that last day, I would like to look back and see the evidence of things being done as I believed. And I would like it to be something so great as people fearfully tormented, people completely unable to function in life, made able, made free, made healed, made well. You know, when he healed 10 lepers, only one came back and he says, you have been made well. What about the other nine? I mean, they're healed of leprosy, yes, but are they made well? I want the definition made well in the people I minister to. I would love it said of me, be it done unto you as you have believed. I 
like that belief to have been something like this, where people are made well, people are set free, demons obey. Why? Because I'm a man under authority, I do what I'm told, and people do what I tell them. That's why I know, Jesus, what you say is done, what you want happens. Just say the word and my, my, my life will be made well. Just say the word and the people I minister can be healed. Is this anywhere near being, called, being coming in the name of Jesus? You know how many times he said, anything you ask in my name? John the Apostle said, to those he believed, he gave the power to become sons and daughters of God. He actually said sons of God, children of God. In plural, but it's translated as sons and daughters in many places. Do you want to be sons and daughters of God? Eligible to be weeping and gnashing in teeth? Or eligible to recline at the table with God the Father? Is that what we want the outcome to be? I know I'm raising questions more than I'm giving answers today, but I look at it and go, whoa, weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't want that. that. People say they believe all the time. I mean, the most common thing I hear all the time from people who have a life that is so miserable you wouldn't want to live it, is I believe. Someone just looked at me the other day and said, I'm okay because I believe. And I'm like, yeah, but are you okay? No. There's nothing okay about your life. It's utter misery. Your belief has had no effect. That's right. Could it be that you're not a man under authority who does what he's told and, is, and people do what you say? Do your children even follow you? Do the mothers of your children follow you? Does anyone look to you, save me, help me, tell me what to do? Does anyone see in your life that you do what you're supposed to do? What is the defenses to the right living? What are the defenses against right living? Today it's religious teaching. It comes from the church. It comes just like it did in those days. The scribes and the Pharisees, the ones that Jesus doesn't preach like. They're the ones saying, don't listen to that guy. Wow. They're the ones saying, he calls himself God. They're the ones lying to get him crucified. I'm a man under authority. What's this mean, I'm under authority? Jesus doesn't preach like them. He preaches with authority. What's this mean? You look up the word authority, and I talked to you a couple weeks ago, if you remember the words Lottie Kaladi, yeah. <laughs> because it was the best picture I had of the definition of authority, the thing that sharply moves objects and puts them in the right place, the thing that the pressing against, it presses, authority is a pressing firmly, it's a direct hit, it's a sudden change. Authority is powerful. It makes things right. Good authority makes things right. Abused authority makes things wrong. Amen. Authority like the scribes makes everything wrong. That's right. Authority like the scribes creates a community where the sons of the kingdom end up weeping and gnashing of teeth. Good. Authority done right causes people to recline at table with the Father in heaven. Which do you want? I want to recline at table. And I don't want to say, hey, I'm settled in what I believe. Hey, I know what I know. And I'm, I want to say, Lord, heal my wrong thinking. Right. Teach me your ways. Right. Lead me in the way that is righteousness and don't let me be deceived. I want his authority in my life so that I do what he says. So that when I tell people what to do, I'm right. Can you imagine the responsibility of telling somebody? I know, I know people in this world who actually preach in high schools. Purity and righteousness all the while while they're getting pregnant and having babies with people they're not married to. And it's like, this hypocrisy can't be true. How could this work out for you in your life? How could this work out for you in your life? How could that ever end up being like Jesus instead of like the scribes? Wow. How could this ever turn out to be reclining at table with the Father instead of being weeping and gnashing of teeth? Shut out. Shouldn't we at least endeavor with our hearts to have a faith that leads to this? And then if we are on our way to reclining at table, shouldn't we then stop and say, wait a minute, can I have some for my brother too? Can I have those that are listening, those that say they don't know, and they're looking to me to say what, what they should know? Come on. Isn't it good if they come and recline at table with the Father with me? 
Or should I be okay with it? Go ahead and shut them out. I made it. Shouldn't I care what happens to the crazy person down by the river that is totally insane that you and I run across, those of us involved in the gospel, that are out there preaching the gospel, and we see this incredible insanity, torment, torment, like, I mean, I don't know how the rest of the world isn't seeing this. It's torment everywhere. It's increasing daily. Just hang out at Yoville Ice Cream. Crazy people walk into the liquor store. I mean, absolutely mind-bogglingly insane. And what, will, what, cause, what, what straightens that up? What Lottie Kaladi will come along and put that right? Which one is it? Is it preaching with authority like Jesus, not like the scribes? Is it living the standard that sets people free, that puts people's minds right, that says, you can go, it'll be done for you as you have believed? What defines what you believe? Is it the outcome? Is it the life lived? What defines what you believe? In this guy, it's what he said. But I think it was clear that he was saying what he lived. I am a man under authority, and I have men under me. I follow, I do what I'm supposed to do, and people better do what I say. So I know that if this works in the Roman army, you say the word in the spiritual army will have no defense against you. It will be done what you say, Jesus. You don't have to come to my house. You don't have to be dirty in the scribes' eyes, in the Pharisees' eyes. You don't have to do that, Jesus. Just say the word. My servant's insanity will leave him. That's a pretty awesome statement. It's a powerful life to live. I'm a man under authority. I know that if I get crooked, authority is going to straighten me out. And I know, those men that follow me know that if they get crooked, authority is going to straighten them out. So Jesus, you can straighten them out with your words. The religious leaders of our time are trying to take authority out of the church, out of the kingdom. But Jesus didn't correct the man and say, listen now, I understand the Roman army works that way, but that's not how it works here. Let me come to your house and let me touch him. Let me show that my presence means something. Let me show how my love works. He didn't correct him at all. In fact, he commended him and said, I have never seen faith like this. You truly understand faith who understand authority. What? Where do you hear that in this world today? I don't. And when I read this story, I go, the church is so powerless that we have to, really, we have to testify to things that are not as though they were because we have so few examples of the insane being made sane, of the infirmed being made well, of the crippled walking. We really do. We make up stories. And I'm just never going to hype God. He does not need me to make him look better. I need him to make me look better. Let me just tell you, this centurion was made to look better. This insane man back in the house was made to look better. And one day, it's all going to be decided. He's going to call the nations together and he's going to divide them, sheep and goats. It's everywhere in the Bible, this, this judgment seat of Christ. This day when it is all decided, this final determination. And if you're making final determinations, you're probably wrong. If you're deciding right from wrong, both I just gave you two forms of judgment. Final determination is forbidden amongst us. us. Me saying you are, it's determined you are saved is just as wrong as saying it's finally determined you're doomed. You're going to hell, buddy. Both of these are final determinations made over your soul, and it's the prohibition in the Sermon on the Mount. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. The other judgment Paul the Apostle said you should make is, this is wrong. This is right. These are the ones you're supposed to make. But we are not allowed to make final determinations. We're supposed to do what the centurion said, and I know how the Spirit works. I do what I'm supposed to, and, ye, and, and people do what I say. And Jesus said, I have not seen faith like this anywhere. 
It'll be done for you according to how you believe. Wow. Wouldn't you like it to be done for you according to how you believe? I would. Let me just confess something to you, and I'm sorry this is not the, the way to build a great ch- big church, but I'm not there yet. I'm on a journey. Things I ask for aren't always done, but I do want you to know a lot of what I ask for is done, and it's way more than it was, and it's going to be more than it is. I promise you. That's where I'm headed. I'm on a journey. My eyes on the prize. I don't know how many days I have left to run, but every one of them I'm running for the prize. I'm pummeling my body into submission. I am pounding myself, my mind, into belief. I am saying, stop believing lies and start believing truth and keep going. Crap happens every day of my life. I'm going on. Houses burn down. Babies get leukemia. I'm moving on. People despise me. I'm moving on. I'm going on. People love me. I like that they love me, but I'm moving on. Come with me. Let's go further up and farther in. Let's keep going. Eyes on the prize. I'm on a journey. But I'd really like to see it done according to how I believe. And I think that what Jesus is saying is that's how it is. So therefore, if it's not being done as I've asked, then it's probably not being done the way I want. But it is being done, I guarantee you, based on my belief. Did you follow that? Should I repeat it for you? If what I'm asking for isn't happening, it's probably being done according to my belief. Jesus said, it'll be done according to your belief. Now, what causes it to be done according to my belief? Well, he told this guy, it's because he said, I'm a man who is under authority. I do what I'm told. Others do what I say. It, you? Because you said that, it's going to be done for you according to your belief. So, I want to be obedient. If you didn't understand the word, I want to be obedient. I want to be obedient to God and what he's asking me to do. I meet the unlovable every day of my life, and let me tell you, it's just as big a challenge for me to love the unlovable. The crazy, insane come into my face, the liars, the cheaters, the thieves. I mean, good grief, I want to just, I want, let's just, let's look for a different crowd. Let's move the church up the hill, let's look for a different crowd. You know what you find out when you find that crowd? They got the same crap the other crowd had. Insanity just looks different. It, this kind of insanity, like I'm going to trust in how I always did it, is the, is the absolute definition of insha- uh, insanity. I'm going to keep doing what I've always done, expecting a different outcome. You just find it looks different. You gotta re- then you got to spend all these years redefining because you moved. Anyone follow any of that? I'm kind of talking fast, huh? I don't usually talk this quick. Trying to fit so much into 1130, you know, kind of thing. Anyway, there's so much. We run into this insanity all the time, and I want what Jesus promised. It's going to be done to you according to how you believed. Now, there's a whole crowd. There's this crowd over here that says, it's because the words of my mouth and all that stuff, Mark 11, you know, say to the mountain move, and you're just, you know, you're saying things that counteract, and it's word of faith and blah, blah, blah. blah. I don't know. I don't see that anywhere in here, but I do say in here, I do say, I do see in here all the time, Jesus saying, it's going to be done to you according to how you believed. Why him? He's a Roman centurion. Do you know how much brutality has been dealt out by the Roman centurion and the Roman army, and he is an officer in the Roman army? It's going to be how he believes? Because he stated that Jesus has all this authority, that Jesus has all this power. He stated he understands Jesus because of Jesus' submission in the spiritual realm, because of his sub- submission in the physical realm. And Jesus says that understanding of the power that works and how it works because of this man's experience in the physical realm of the Roman army, You'd think Jesus knew or didn't know on that day this guy might be the one presiding over his crucifixion. Sitting there saying, truly, this man was the Son of God. How did he know that? From the way he died? Or because his servant was healed? May or may not be. You'll decide. It's just a question. It's just a, a, a curiosity. Hmm. Is he the one? Anyway, 
There's a lot in this in this little story. Can I confess something to you? I have no desire whatsoever to do what I'm told. It does not come naturally to me. Can I get an amen, somebody? (laughs) I have no desire whatsoever to tell anybody what to do. This is the one that's going to surprise you because I do this all day long. But I have no desire to tell anybody what to do. I am not responsible. I want no responsibility. Go do what you want to do. See how it works. Please. But you know as well as I do that I don't live that way. I do exactly what I'm told. Pretty much. <laughs> as, uh, as, except when my wife tells me. That's right. That's right. No. I do what I'm told by the authority above me. (laughs) I had to say it. I had to. I don't want to get all confused with this. uh, Me and her are equals. (laughs) You act like it's too late. I can't fix this. I can Lottie Kaladi needs to straighten this one up. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. All right. Even Stephanie Mumby's looking at me over the glasses she's not wearing. No, I didn't. No. No. Anyway, praise the Lord. Let's not lose the subject here. I didn't lose it. Anyway. I am lost. <laughs> so this authority, you know, let me just take you back to something. You know, everything that we try to do right sometimes gets a little skewed. And if we are trusting God as the authority of this world, let me just tell you he has every answer. When I read the Old Testament, it tells me one is coming. He is coming. The entire book tells he is coming. When I read the New Testament, the entire New Covenant says he is here. All the answers, all that, all that we need to know is right here in how to walk forward, having the insane made well, the crippled made whole, forgiveness of sins, fullness of the Holy Spirit, It's all found right here in Jesus. This story tells us an awful lot about how to have things done according to how we believe. One of the most important subjects, the statements, is that it is happening according to how you believe. When things are happening wrong, go back to your belief. What is it you're saying about what you believe? And I'm not talking about what you think. Every day of your life, you are stating what you believe. When necessary, you're using words. You are using the actions of your life, the decisions of your day, and the words of your mouth to declare what you believe. And it is happening according to what you believe. If you don't like the outcome, look back at what you believe and even where you found what you believe. It might have come from scribes and Pharisees. It might have come from people trying really hard to walk with God. It might come from a lot of places. But I must tell you that this is the Son of God. Listen to him. The Father in heaven is speaking from a cloud. This is my Son. Listen to him. Jesus sent two disciples to go steal some donkeys. They came back in a Roman-held world having stole those donkeys. Jesus said, if anybody asks you, just say, hey, the Lord needs them. And when they got back, they said they found it just as he told them it would be. I'm telling you that even if Steve Orsillo tells you something, it's not going to be how Steve Orsillo said it. It's going to be. It's going to be just as Jesus told you it would be. And you can count on it. When he says to a centurion, the greatest statement of faith is, I'm a man under authority. 
I do what I'm told, others do what I say, and I know Jesus, if you say it, it'll be done. That's the greatest statement of faith in all of Israel. You can count on it. People can explain that away. They can come with all different kinds of theories. They can show you their educational status. They can show you their political status. They can show you their church status. But it isn't going to be how they say it's going to be. It's going to be just as Jesus told you it would be, I promise you. If he said it, that settles it. I want to follow it. <sighs> you meet insane people, their answer is going to be Jesus. You meet broken people, the answer is going to be Jesus. You meet Christians who are not seeing what they believe happening, it's going to be according to their belief, I promise you. You want to know how to believe? Learn from Jesus. Are you following me? Amen. I am a man under authority. I, with all of my heart, want to do what I'm told. I pray some of you need to follow me. Most of you need to follow me and do what I tell you. Until you come to a point in your life where you don't need me telling you anymore. You need to follow to be followed. You need to follow to not go astray. And you need to follow to become a leader that helps others not go astray. The greatest statement of faith is not, I am a blood-bought child of God. The straight, greatest statement of faith is, I do what I'm told and others do what I say. Right. And they don't. And you won't be lost. So good. When you become a man who can say to others, follow me, I won't lead you astray. Follow me, I won't fail you. I will not let you down. It's because you know that you do what he tells you to do. The assurance of your salvation, you want to be assured you're saved? Do what he says. The assurance of our salvation is that we follow Jesus and we do what he says. We obey. We love the unlovable. We go the extra mile. We turn the other cheek. We, we do good to those who persecute us and we love those who hate us. He goes on and on. Are you with me? Amen. This is what I believe. This is what I know. Someone asked me an appointment today to help them overcome wrong thinking. I said, why me? I believe you have something. I can tell you there'll be freedom in that person's life. It'll be done because they believe I have something. Let me tell you what I have. I'm a man under authority. I do what I'm told. I baptized three baptisms in a pool because I was told to. I do what I'm told, and I, others do what I tell them. And it will be done according to what I believe. It always is. Are you with me? Yes. I pray you are.